We are live, and by live, I do not mean live. <laughs> we were pre-recorded <laughs> live. Pre-recording. We are trying out their new 4K recording feature, so you can see our like imperfections on our skin now. And yeah, you can talk to my dermatologist and, and we get a chance. Let's see if it works. <laughs> but um, we have a the second twin back in the studio. Feels after good to be like, back with the boys. It's been a while. Where have you been? It's been almost four weeks, I think. Right? Something like that. Well, I have been obeying God's first command, some would say, which is go forth and be fruitful. So uh, we got a little fruit at home, and her name is Giovanna. <laughs> and she's extremely adorable and and um, trying to not be biased here, but she is the cutest thing in the world. So come fight me. No, I'm very, kidding. I, I very agree. valid reason to be gone. Yeah, very valid reason. And, uh, I just cannot, I'll tell you in the audience, like I told this to the guys, two words, and this is all I'll say, otherwise I will gush uncontrollably. So I've been having to reel myself back a lot, but uh, gratitude, grateful, and fulfillment. Those two words in profound beauty have come into my life, and it's all because of the Lord's beautiful gifts of children. And so I'm so happy to be a dad. It's awesome. been great. So um. And it's good to be with you guys. Honestly, I did miss you guys. Mm-hmm. Did miss you guys a lot. We missed you. I mean, I got my brother. He lives right. We have houses next to each other, and uh, that's funny. Joe's kind of like I know w- wives have midwives. Joe is my husband wife. <laughs> He's my husband mid, mid husband or whatever. The, yeah. Oh, so shit. thanks for being there for me, Joe. You're the best, man. My pleasure. You're my. Uh, she is perfect. She's yeah. she's amazing. And you glow. I was telling. You can see now. <laughs> the glow. <laughs> I'm glowing, guys. You can turn off the light. Yeah. Got a halo on. <laughs> it's but, been uh, so what are we doing today, guys? Today, we have um, Bible study for you guys. So um, some good daily bread, some meat that we're going to be serving up. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Lord, God, uh, guide us in our exposition of Matthew 16. And we pray, Lord, that your words will be spoken. If there's any errors, they'll be corrected. Um, and we pray that it would be something that our listeners can use um, and that they will enjoy this study with us, Father. We glorify you, magnify you, and we lift you up as high as we can, Father. Give us hearts of repentance that seek your face in all things. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. All right. Who wants to break this baby open? The Pharisees and Sadducees demand signs. All right. Matthew 16, 1 here. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, uh, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing it among among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves of the five five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of the sa- of bread, but the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. <laughs> They're trying their best. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm. um, so this is Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ. Uh, 13 now. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any one would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So beautiful. One thing that struck me was Peter being revealed a deep truth. Some would say the Logos in that moment saying, "You, Jesus, you are the Christ. And then also <laughs> being used as an instrument for Satan a paragraph later, you know, that kind of speaks to the highs and lows we feel <laughs> as we walk with Christ. Um Pretty cool I and mean, in the terms of humility, you know, that Peter could go through something that we all experience, you know, it, um, it's, it's a part of our walk, isn't it? It really is. Okay. Chapter 16 terms and people were delving into the notes sign from heaven is referring to a miracle or supernatural occurrence. Levin means yeast, a form of bacteria used to make bread rise. Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, Philippi was a city in the time of Christ located in the foothills of Mount Hermon, about 15 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi, Philippi, uh, Philippi was named by Herod Philip, whose father, Herod the Great, had built a temple there. Philip took a special interest in the village and enlarged it, attaching his name to that of Caesar. The name Philip gave the town also served to distinguish it from another town called Caesarea. The sign of Jonah. Here we have a wonderful moment to observe symbolism and typology present in the Bible. Symbolism is a language type. Without symbols, we wouldn't have mathematics, the letters we use to make words, or the punctuation to write. Symbols can have assigned meanings, like a letter in the alphabet or math symbol, or it can have a universal meaning dependent on self-evident truths you can see, like a seed represents life, or water the renewal of life. We will call these two types man-made symbols and natural symbols. Though common language is useful, it has an Achilles heel and is prone to change and evolve, leading to confusion in definitions. Word may, words may seem relatively stable, but history has shown that definitions attached to words are fluid and subject to change. A word starting off with one definition can mean something entirely different a thousand years later. This issue is further compounded when translating one old or dead language to another. This evolution is called etymology, or, yeah, etymology. Symbolism, on the other hand, is less prone to change, therefore giving it a far greater staying power and allowing it to communicate meaning no matter the culture or age. Symbolism's ability to transcend the shortcomings of dialects and vernacular make it a useful tool for communicating messages meant to last. For this reason, symbolism is apparent in many of Jesus' parables. Typology is the study of categorizing similar stories and circumstances so we can apprehend the deeper meaning and importance of recurrent themes present in the Bible. It also serves to demonstrate the continuity within the Bible as a God-inspired document, or more precisely, the living Word of God. Typology will help us to understand the meaning of symbols and their relationship to other symbols. 
Here, Jesus references the story of Jonah. Let's take apart the symbolism and typology, starting with synopsis of the story of Jonah. The hard-headed prophet Jonah was sent by God to ask the city of Nineveh to repent. The Ninevites were Gentiles and therefore looked at as dogs by the Jews. Jonah, being a Jew, was not happy about his, this assignment and wanted the Ninevites to burn. Jonah decided to disobey God's command by escaping in a boat. But God causes a big storm, leading the crew of the boat to throw Jonah overboard, where he is swallowed by a big fish. He stays three days in the belly of the fish and is then expelled onto the beach. Jonah begrudgingly serves the warning to the Ninevites, to which they heed and save their town. Depressed and wishing to die, Jonah goes into the desert to see what will happen to the city. God causes a vine to grow over the booth Jonah has made as a shelter, for which Jonah is very grateful. God then causes the vine to die, making Jonah again depressed and wishing to die. God then asks Jonah why he wishes to die, to which Jonah replies, The vine has died, leaving me sun-scorched. God then goes on to teach Jonah a lesson, saying, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, a great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? and also much cattle. Jesus is using the story to foreshadow his crucifixion, death, and resurrection, as well as contrast the Ninevites' ability to repent and follow God despite their naivety to the Pharisees, who seeing a leper and a demon-possessed mute receiving healing and yet remain, remaining hard of heart. The symbolism broke down. Boat slash water. Humans are land creatures. The boat represents journey. The water in this context means an unknown and unnatural environment. Storm represents chaos and retribution. Three days in the belly. This signifies death and the incapacity of the body to carry out duty. Vine represents life. Jesus uses this symbolism to show the Pharisees that like Jonah, he will be in the belly of the earth for three days and be risen on the third. This example of repetition helps us to see how the story of death and resurrection is present in Bible's different story, stories. It also goes to show that Jesus has entered into the next phase of his mission trip, preparing himself as a sacrifice. By reading through the Bible a few times, you will have gained a general idea of the content. Many concepts will not be understood, but with time, God will show you the incredible continuity embedded within its pages. Even simple stories like Cain and Abel take on a deeper meaning. The symbolism and typology will come alive, allowing the apparent cryptic or simple passages to gain deeper meaning. No one will have a perfect understanding of the Bible. Only God does. But read on and dig deep. Revelation awaits. Note. According to the Hebrew reckoning of time, the days could refer to three days in part or in whole. Jesus was probably crucified on a Friday, Mark 15, 42. According to the standard reckoning, Jesus died at about 3 p.m., Matthew 27, 46. On Friday, that's day one. He remained dead for all of Saturday, day two, and rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, day three. Attempts to place Jesus' death on Wednesday to accommodate a literal 72-hour period are probably unnecessary once we take into account the Hebrew method of reckoning each day as a beginning as beginning at sundown. So it seems that the expression three days and three nights was used as a figure of speech meant to signify any part of three days. Anything you want to say about that? <laughs> well... I'd say that it can be some, if you're approached by somebody who says, was it really three days? Say, for instance, this is going back to the symbolism. We can get lost in the weeds by trying to fight battles that are, are sort of dumb. You know, um, three days has the symbolic meaning for 
carrying in tempo with the rest of the stories of the Bible. So was it 72 hours to the minute or within an hour? Mm -hmm. What are we really trying to address with that? Well, the fact that the story of Jonah, the rest of the, the stories that are speaking to the death and resurrection of Christ, that is the continuity you should be looking for, not a a literal three days resulting in the hourly uh, result of seventy two hours. So um, I'd say pick your battles. You know, if somebody's coming at you with, was it really three days? You know, at that point, you can just say the Jews didn't view time that way. That's it's again coming to that issue of etymology, like. The culture at the time did not look at three days the same way you do. Um, so that's important to take into account because they're writing at that time. So, um, yeah. I thought it was cool how uh, God brought up the cattle. Yeah. You know, he was, he was thinking about the people, but he also thought about the cattle and the animals as well because they were going to be served in the uh, retribution without the repentance. And the king ended up putting everybody in sackcloth and ashes from the king all the way down to the animals. And um, I think that shows God's love for animals and for the creation and for everything in this domain, really. And yeah. that when uh, he asked us to be faithful for stewards of this world and this planet, he's, uh, by including the cattle, you can see him uh, our, including our, like our responsibility for these creatures that he cares about. They're, uh, they're under our responsibility and mm -hmm. that the way we get judged kind of falls down on them as well. Yeah. And I think that's really cool. I thought, I think that's awesome. Insight. Yeah. yeah. So it was a hard the, God there. I was also thinking about that story of Jonah. Like, do we have any other examples of God going after a non-Jewish nation and telling them to repent? Well, he did with the Canaanites, you know. Um, well, that that's kind of my point is yeah. I think like, the Ammonite or the Ammonite. well, we we look at some of these mm. like judgments that God does on these nations, sure, as like oh that's horrible. But I'm like I bet how many examples of Jonah kind of are there where they were warned by God and just not written down like in in the Bible sense. You have uh, Sodom and Gomorrah too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so was Sodom and Gomorrah were they a Jewish city? I don't know. I don't know. Well, there wasn't any Jews There's at the Abraham. time. There's Lot. Abraham the first. That was Jew. before. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So but anyway, yeah, I was just thinking like, I wonder how many unwritten examples of that we there are actually of yeah. Jonah type stories. I think that's why Nineveh stands out is because they may have been one of the very few that did repent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also you had this typology with just Jonah's defiance of God and then, you know, spending time in the <laughs> three days yeah. and whatnot. See, I thought you were going to go down the rabbit hole of like, why would he judge nations that weren't his people at that time? You know, or care about him. Oh, at all. yeah. Just well, he, I, I, I didn't ever think of that until you brought that up just then. Why is he judging Nineveh? Why is he judging Gomorrah? Why the Canaanites, if they're not his people? Well, he, he, they are, well, it's important to realize that God judges every, every, he judged the Canaanites. You know, that's why they were dealt with. And people miss the intern of them having so many moments of grace where they were, you know, don't sacrifice your children like these. There's abominations that they were involved with that they persisted in that led to that judgment. And um, so I guess the question is, does God only judge the Jews? It's kind of what it sounds like you're asking. No, I mean, I think it. Oh, uh, old covenant and before the new covenant, Jews being God's chosen people. And um, him basically just communicating with them. And then the New Covenant, of course, we have the Gentiles being brought in. So I just didn't think about it from Mike had just said. Uh, why would he be judging these Gentiles, so to speak, in the Old Covenant if they weren't part of his people? Well, I think it speaks... Well, there is, um, I think, Balak, you know, he was... Um, an oracle that had a certain relationship to God where he could speak to him. He wasn't a Jew. That's and, uh, yeah. And then I know we know it from the Jews narrative, you know, right? Well, he's, they, they, they God's heart is for, for people to abide in goodness. Yeah. 
It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or not, but there's promises associated with the Jews because it's their story that we hear a lot more of. Mm. But I'm well, and positive. God also had expectations on humanity before yeah. the flood. Like, obviously, they were defying. That's right. That's right. Humanity, there was expectations there. Because Moses wasn't a Jew. That's Enoch that. wasn't a Jew. Um, Cain and Abel point. weren't Jews. Yeah. Um, I think God's precedence for good and judgment and the judgment of a man's actions has been there for, since Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. But, um yeah, I think that it speaks to a heart of grace because he's he is still trying to get even Gentile nations to repent. Like he's still he's still communi like I think people might miss the fact that he is communicating with Gentile nations. He's not just communicating with the Jews. Maybe if you read the Old Testament, that might be I mean, it, it seems like he only talks to the Jews in the temple and the priests and the kings. But obviously he uses his prophets to talk to more than just the Jews. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes, and you have to ask the question, is the Old Testament an all encompass all encompassing history of what happened then? Like how many were there multiple Jonah type prophets out there talking Probably, to Gentiles? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even in Chronicles, there's a few um prophets that are mentioned that you know, they get a few sentences, maybe, <clears throat> but they were sent to turn the hearts of Judah back to Christ or back to God Christ. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good thought, though. It's like God's unchanging, I think, is what we begin to understand. You're right. Yeah. A little foreshadowing there. Condensed in the New Testament because the Jews at first in the New Testament, they get the word first. You know, they get the way first. They get Christ first. And then, you know, then Peter gets his dream and Paul comes into it. I forget just how long the timeline is there when Paul comes in. It's a few years. It's a long after time, Christ, yeah. After Christ. Um, after Christ uh, is resurrected, and uh, it almost seems like a condensed version of the Old Testament, you know. Or it does. Maybe, maybe not, because I mean, like like uh, Mike just said, like well, before it is. the flood, you have these examples of the whole people being judged, and then oh. you have the separation of Israel from the rest. And they've been separated, and uh, yeah, it's interesting in the typology. Would that be the right word? Mm -hmm. Historical. Yeah, there's there's no. I don't think there's one single story that or passage where you can't find um, some typology you can uh, attach to it. I mean, the, the challenging parts would be like some of the uh, prophetic books where I think people re can read too much into it, you know, and, and begin to make errors because they're, you know, confabulating a bit. But um, yeah, with like the parabolic talk or these these examples of the Jews, you know. 40 days in the desert or 40 years in the desert, Jesus 40 years in the, you know, or 40 days, you know, mm -hmm. and it's fast. Like there's all kinds of that stuff. Yeah. Which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So Peter's journey, you want to take this on Joey? Okay. Um, Peter's journey, the confession. Peter finally was in a situation where his foot, where he, sh where he shoot first, ask questions later strategy yielded more than just embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Jesus tested the disciples by asking them who the people say he is, to which they respond with several examples, none of which include Messiah. Interestingly, Jesus mm -hmm. <clears throat> even said to be John the Baptist risen from the dead, though Jesus was well known during John's life and ministry. Go figure. Clearly, the people had no idea who Jesus was. Jesus then turns and asks his disciples who they think he is. Peter guns a blazing, makes a powerful confession to Christ's identity. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. This amazing moment leads Peter to getting a whole new identity. Jesus first acknowledged and praised God for the moment so that no man, specifically Peter, could boast, and then ordained Peter as the church rock, foundation of the church, giving him the keys to heaven. In this short but powerful example, we learn that when a person is reborn and changed, when they accept Christ, a person is reborn and changed when they accept Christ. It is through confession that we find our new identity in Christ as he assigns us new meaning and purpose. It's important to understand that for anyone genuinely confessing Christ as Lord, the transformation is total and permanent. Everyone has a nuanced experience post-confession, and thank God for that. 
The beauty and glory of the unique relationship God has with all his children is a reminder that our God knows all of our hearts and needs completely. Not everyone will be given direct orders, apart from the order and the will of God we receive in the Bible, the way that Peter did. The important thing to focus on is that we carry out his will and direction found in the Bible. That is a tall order in itself. And by following this dictum, you will cultivate an obedient heart, which is the highest form of worship. So don't be dismayed and your marching orders aren't given to you like Peter's. Rest assured that obedience in the simple things is observed and rewarded by God. Matthew 10, 40. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet but receives a prophet's reward, and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So beautiful. Note. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we see Simon referred to as Peter, but it was important at this moment the name of Peter was given Simon by Jesus. The two years prior to this moment, the man's name had been Simon bar Yona. Peter uses the Greek word petros, which means rock in, this small, in the sense of small stone. Later, when Jesus says, on this rock he will build the church, Matthew uses a different Greek word petrus, which means cliff. To these two words are different genders in Greek, so clearly Matthew was trying to make a contrast between the two. When Peter boldly stepped forward to confess Jesus, they divine by divine planning, Peter's confession would serve as an example to the church overall. We could say that Peter was a chip off the old block, or a stone compared to a cliff, Jesus being the cliff or the cornerstone. Note, Another excellent example of typology and symbolism, this name-changing business, is apparent in the lives of many First Testament figures, Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel, Israel, Sarah, Sariah, Sariah to Sarah, just to name a few. The symbolic nature of this event is to signify a changed identity and a new life path. That's cool. To upset the Catholics, because I think that rock. No, you saved. don't, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like you kind of phrased that in the notes there as the Catholic view that yeah. Peter is the rock of the church, whereas yeah. I think the the Protestant view is the the rock he's talking about is the confession itself of Jesus. Yeah, and he what... he did that. You know, he was the first to do that. So it's like he's setting the precedence. Well, I kind of wonder he used a different word for him there. I wonder if there's like a reason for that. Cause like the if his cliff and the pebble. Yeah. I, I, I saw some people say like you, you build uh, like many were all bricks in the, I don't know, weird stuff like that. That was like a pebble on top of another pebble and a pebble, you know, he's the first pebble, you know, to mm -hmm. confess Christ. Even though there was a lot of people, as you saw before, like even the Gentile man trying to save his daughter, or a son, and he bows. You know that's worship. He he didn't know he was the Christ with the background of the Jews saying this is the Savior of humanity. Perfect. You know what's the context what's the Greek involved? Word, or what's Christ like? What is that Greek word? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it, there's a lot of history to that. Um, Christos <clears throat> is the know. Messiah. I if I, uh... Dave, do you know what Christ is in the Greek, um, or I guess the, Matthew would have been written. Mm -hmm. Anointed one, yeah, it comes from the Greek root word "kryo," which means to anoint. The word "Christ" is a title that originated from the Hebrew word "mashiach." which also means anointed one in the Bible. The title Christ is used for Jesus, and Jesus Christ means Jesus the Messiah, or Jesus the anointed one. Hmm. The Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I heard Christos, so this is what I understood. So Jesus Christ, Jesus the man, and then he's the first to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. 
So he's the man with the spirit in completion. I mean, the Holy Spirit was given many times during the Bible. Um, for certain times, people, the spirit would fall upon them. But for Christ to be the Christos, like um, I was taught that the Lord Jesus Christ is probably the most precise name for God, Lord being Father, Jesus being man, Christos, Holy Spirit. So you have the Trinity present in that name. Um, and that's why the anointing is important, because that's when Jesus got his anointing, when he was anointed by through his baptism and the dove descended. And that, again, it's cool. It's an animal, right? A dove, beautiful dove, gentle little dove. That's the most powerful spirit in the world. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's not an eagle, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so back to what you were saying. Um, it all depends on a lot of the way you attach. Uh, like Joe was bringing up the Jews, right? So you could read the text, and I know I did. When I first read the Bible, I was like, oh, the Jews are super special. Well, yeah. But I think where you arrive at after study is they're the first among equals. And that's a good way to look at it. So, so you're comparing that to Peter, like being the first In some among way, equals. yeah. But I, I think, yeah. you know, he's he's mentioned in the Bible a lot. That's you know, interesting for a good like, reason. God came to Abraham, and, and Jesus says that uh, God revealed this to you so that he might not boast. Yes. Um, so we don't want to boast a, for Peter. Right, right. Like right, the yeah. Israel. Like, yeah, like if we didn't want Peter to boast, we shouldn't boast for Peter. Right. Right. Like he had the given, he was given that revelation. And he spoke out, and that was his moment of faith to make the choice to speak out. And, and at that Abraham, point, it's yeah. Like he was given that choice, and then he. He moved in faith um, upon that anointing that God gave him. Yeah. You know, and so and a I bit of both. It's like God shows you, he gives you anointing, gives you revelation, and then it's your job within faith to move through yeah. on that. And I think um, another sort of typology moment. I can feel like the Calvinists come in on that one. Calvinists <laughs> or the Catholics? The Calvinists and be like, you know, God gave him that revelation. Right. Like, like he's, he's predestined there. You know, and that's like God opening the door. He's giving you the revelation. It's your choice what you do to with speak it, it right? It's, you know, yeah. Like he spoke it. Yeah. That might be, you know, Peter's moment. Mm -hmm. Um, another cool thought of typology that kind of I thought about was context. So Jesus is developing relationship with Peter. He says, Follow me. That's a big moment for Peter. He leaves his family, his business, he follows Jesus. Um, that was a sacrifice, no doubt. Um, same thing with Abraham. He's in his tent, and God says, you're coming out of the tent. You know, um, So he does that. And then there's that second test. So Abraham leading his son up, that was like, now you know who I am. God's like, I've delivered you through a lot of stuff. Oh, boy. And now I'm going to test you again. So you see Peter now has context for who Jesus is. He followed. He's been following him for a while now. He's seen some miracles. He now knows, like to a certain extent, what Messiah actually means. So like his confession carries a, a huge weight because he's been taught what it is he's saying. Um, he knows what the Christ means um, in a more profound way. And I feel like that's this, kind of the same. Is God God to you? You know, is Jesus not just a cool guy to fall around? Or is he really the Christ, man? And, and he's know, just like Abraham. It's like, too. are you going to give up your son for God? You know, and he also could test. think like there was, I mean, just within your uh, kind of narrative there and how many other people saw Christ do those miracles, heard him talk, there's 12 disciples and um, how many people interface with God and they have revelation and they can see the miracles and they can, they're right in front of them and hear, hear God talk in their life to them, to people around them, see the miracles, see God moving and yet not uh, make the choice hmm. um, to follow him. And Peter did, you he know, did. and Abraham did. Yeah, and King David did, and Solomon did, and Paul did, and mm -hmm. you, you can see that choice and and that uh, that beauty within these specific characters in the Bible. Like Peter yeah. was always outspoken, and he was always one of those guys that would would shoot, like you said, what <laughs> shoot first, and first, and then questions ask later. questions later. <laughs> you know, and um, speaking of him, beautiful shooting first, he's going to get in trouble again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very quickly. That's why we say that about Peter. Uh, go ahead. Mikey. Peter's journey, the rebuke, um, deny yourself. 
You might say Peter is riding high in the hog. He was just, uh, he has just been highly esteemed by given, uh, by being given a place of authority in front of all the disciples and the quote keys to the he- keys to heaven. It's safe to say Peter's head was just a weensy bit inflated, <laughs> but who can blame him? It was a big moment. But the I Zeppelin was coming that. down. <laughs> nah, I'm giving you the keys to heaven, kiddo. Like, wow, my head would just explode. Peter, thinking <laughs> that he could discern truth more effectively than Jesus, pulls him aside, almost like a concerned parent takes their child aside to scold them after bad behavior, to dismiss Jesus' prophetic statement about his coming death. Jesus promptly rebukes him, calling him Satan, which we know means adversary. Why an adversary? Because Peter was concerned with his own desires. God bless him. Peter loved Jesus and didn't want him to die. But hidden in this seemingly innocent facade was selfishness and a lack of faith. If Peter would have examined himself concerning his latest claim that Jesus was Messiah, he would have submitted to Jesus no matter the conditions or stipulations. But Peter is a man and a stubborn one at that. But fortunately, Peter for or for Peter and us, we get a lesson out of it. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Wow. <clears throat> Cryptic, Matthew sixteen twenty eight. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This verse has been a cause for some speculation. Some say it has been it is the manifestation of the church rising from nothing into a massive entity. Some say it's the destruction of the temple, and still others say it is John seeing prophetic visions in the book of Revelation. It isn't completely apparent which supposition is the winner, but rest assured Jesus spoke it for a reason. It is in these cases that we believers employ our faith and maintain our high view of scripture, meaning that we submit ourselves to certain mysteries consoled by the gift of faith. So, Sorry, folks, if we knew everything, there would be no room for faith, and faith is the vehicle by which we receive grace. So think about it, ponder it, and search the scriptures and pray about it, but by no means writhe and pine with hope lost. So this is the unedited version of my notes. Oh. <laughs> um, I did make a big edit to this because like uh, the very next chapter, like you read, there's Jesus's transfiguration. Mm-hmm. And so it dawned on me. I was like, okay, there weren't chapters back and like we are making these chapters up, you know, uh, Jesus you know matthew's writing this and then immediately we're going to the transfiguration that's probably what he was getting at was that peter and john would see the transfiguration christ as god almost you know and and that happens directly after so i did add that to my notes just in my Mm -hmm. archive where i was like it's most likely gonna be exactly what follows next but it's not in these notes so i would encourage people to read Matthew 17, where it talks about the transfiguration. And I can't wait to do that um, because it's going to tie this up with a lot more of a feeling of, okay, that makes sense. That's what that's what that's what the Matthew was getting at, because their their chapters are broken up. I think it coincides a bit with Matthew 24 as well with the the end time stuff. Um, Because I know like my our pastor went through, I think, this chapter and he basically explained it as um Jesus' king, like this kingdom started when Jesus ascended to heaven. So that is the what is talked about there. Mm-hmm. And that this, was, uh, by the way, uh, very compelling. Yeah. I thought that was very compelling. And yeah, I liked well, it. I, I respected that I never heard before. Yeah, I actually like And that, you know, I didn't write my notes for that. That's where I stopped. And it was because I did not feel led by the Spirit to write on it. And it was hard for me to uh, feel okay with that. But um you know it's not it's it's tough but all i can tell you is that as much as we want to know um i still stick with the basics that that chapter is meant to say that you have peace Mm -hmm. and that you should have peace going through all these times and as long as you're obedient you will know when these times are upon you um so 
yeah, you know, I uh, I'm always humbled by the last three or the last. I think it's the last. Yeah, it's the last chapter in Revelation where it says anybody who takes away from this, you know, there's a penalty. But if you add to this, it's a penalty and a half. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, all right, man, I'm not. I'm you know, all I can say is it's meant to encourage. It's meant to bear good fruit. And if it's not doing those things, then you're probably wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I did like your pastor's um, expose on it. I thought it was brilliant. Well, I know he was and nervous it about was it too. Fresh. Oh, he said it in the beginning. It's like, kinda... I have a minority uh, view on this. I think we'll kind of leave that a mystery for you all there. <laughs> <laughs> we Maybe for another have, we? <laughs> Maybe for another podcast. Cause that's, well, we'll the... get to Matthew 24 eventually. Yeah. We're wow. At yeah. So we'll have to cover right it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. No um, doubt about it. You know, one thing I want to elaborate on because it's on my heart, and I know I shared this with you guys before um, the podcast is uh, is um, that Hebrews verse that I brought up that I've been working on memorizing. But that's I don't so want cool, by the way, for for camera. Um, I'll pull it up here. Yeah, lately I've been reading King James, um, New King James, or Old both. King James, both really. Yeah. Cool. A little bit more razzle dazzle going on there. I love the NS or NSV, but sometimes uh, the ESV. Little, ESV. That's what I meant. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's a little flat. Can be. I feel like uh, it's just uh, in King James, a little poetic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So thinking about Peter, he's been having a revelation from God, and then he hears God, the Messiah, tell him what's going to happen to him, mm-hmm. and then he refutes it mm-hmm. because it doesn't line up with his 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 idea of what should happen to Messiah, even though Messiah, God, or told him what, what's going to happen to him. And how often we in, in our lives do that, um, where God will say, Oh, put something in our lives and he's asking us to step out in faith because we know God is God. And when Hebrews, we say, when we come to God for he who comes to God must believe that he is. Yeah. And I see a lot of people, including myself will come to God, ask him for things or, you know, pray about things and then be presented with a circumstance to refute it. And, and I have to, ask myself in that moment do i really believe god is god Mm -hmm. do i really believe he's all powerful do i really believe that he holds the galaxies in one hand and he also holds my heart in the other hand and that he's capable of doing godly things do i really believe that do i really believe he's he is god when i come to god do i believe that he is god Mm. do i have that faith in that question and here's peter you know right there with the messiah you know, having him in front of him, tell him what's happening. And just knowing that being in God's presence, even in the presence of God, we will have that inclination to serve our own desires yeah. and to, to lack that faith, you know, to put to, to recognize God as being God mm-hmm. and his plan as being perfect and that his plan will be done mm-hmm. if we just be obedient, like right. you were saying, <clears throat> and that peace that we have when we when we're able to to be obedient. Yeah. It's like that, be, that yeah. beautiful verse, um, be still and know that I am God. Mm. It's like was Peter wasn't still in his spirit when he received that information from Christ. He was writhing with it, he was fighting with it. He was like, you know, he was like, um I got the Isaac, case Abraham. To Isaac, Isaac, I kind of view it you know. through a bit of a different lens though, because I think Peter like I th- I think it was a logical response like anyone would have had that it's like you're following jesus and your guy's just submitting like defeat basically like it just doesn't make sense so i think anyone and everyone in that circumstance is gonna have a similar reaction to peter and i think it shows a bit well, that's that, what joe's saying is we do it every day yeah you know it's like it's like that's where we uh gosh i know it's but I, it's like but it's more like a it's like our logic is not god's logic and uh like we can't see the big picture like that to Peter's mind, to our mind in that moment, that made no sense. 
Yeah, like they, literally no logical sense. No, right. Hard nosed logic would say, okay, I just got the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Like, let's and go now get Messiah after it. Now he's just gonna say he's dead. <laughs> like, like where, they, where's the kingdom now? You know, it's it's being shut down. I mean, in every way, the sense of the word, you know, he's probably betting on, you know, Christ being this bet David, you know, take over Jerusalem. And he's just <clears> like, oh, all right, we just took a left turn. <clears> yeah, maybe he needs to be encouraged a little bit, you know. When I, I gives like, you a whole new respect for like Abraham, though. You know, like, um, yeah, he, 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 make he, didn't, sense. he didn't contend, though. Right. Abraham was silent. And you know what's beautiful mm -hmm. about Abraham, like being almost the better version in terms of like how we should act or the high, the highest version of faith in those hard times is when when his son asked him, he says, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. Yeah. And it's like that is the statement where it, Jesus was providing for Peter, mm. but he was rejecting what he was providing rationally. Like you're saying, Mike, it's rational, but um, it's also a rejection of, of, <clears throat> of, of what God is providing. Oh, it's also he's, God is God and he's right. watching him do these miracles, bending the all and you know, breaking all the laws of logic and, you know, our scientific laws, so to speak, because he's God, you know, and uh, our logic won't, won't make sense of God's plan because he's outside of those rules. I would say we're not logical enough. Like when somebody's like, it's just not rational. I'm like, you're just not rational <laughs> enough. Like even look at quantum physics. Like it really doesn't make sense. They know how stuff will act. Like they put things in equations because it works, mm -hmm. but it makes no sense. It's right. not logical. It's Einstein not rational. Not, nothing to do with it. <laughs> They're like, it's confounding. Mm -hmm. it's 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 another level of god's it's proving he is like he's well, like i am man i kind of think of like a modern he example is, just because yeah. politics is so hot for everyone right now okay, and i think like I th well, are you I take kinda, it as bike <laughs> i kind of view it like i love where he's going me too like christians have this like adamant view on politics like we gotta like win this election on yes the world's going to hell and blah 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 and i'm like well maybe god's got the bigger picture that you know, if we don't win and in the short term, it is kind of chaos that in the end he comes up like, you know, Jesus died for three days, looked like bad times. Peter was denying him at his uh, crucifixion and then we come out on top in the end. And I'm like, Preach like, it, well, how about we view it. stuff like this with the Preach like election it. or other things in our lives? Like, yeah, we might lose this. We think we lost this battle and it's politics. But mm -hmm. what's the long term outcome? That's right. That's like, calm good. down. <laughs> it's a God's great in example. Control. Yeah. Uh, we were, yeah. I love that. I, I love that. I love that so much because that's the heart and that's the soul and that's the beauty and the peace and the faith and the light that we need to shine as sons and daughters of Christ every day. And I love that so much. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be dependent on an election. No. You know, if you do the right thing and you obey, even if it means being Abraham sacrificing, like, can you think of Abraham saying, I believe God's going to give me, be the, make me the progenitor of all these kids and these nations while simultaneously having to sacrifice a son. Mm. Yes. That, that's a yes. And so like, where are, are you, is your vote dependent on, or are you just obeying God and having peace, being still and knowing is God? Um, that's a great one. I think that's going to touch base with a lot of people now because there's a lot of there's a lot of anxiety going around for this one. Yeah, yeah, everyone's like, yeah. it's the big like if, yeah. if we lose this, we're changed forever. It's yeah, like, it's like the point of no return in a lot of people's minds. We don't we don't serve a, a, a we serve the last all election powerful was, God. It was the last the same narrative too. Yeah, guess what? We're still here. Yeah, yeah. and it's on repeat. You know, yeah. we don't sign to that, and I love that because we need to shine that light. We need to shine that faith. We believe in an all-powerful God, and we are we are obedient to Him no matter what, and yeah. that's our that's our that's our we glory within that. Yeah, and ultimately, a man's not going to save you. That that man already came, and he's here to stay. And yeah. His name is Jesus. Man's not going to do that for you. It doesn't mean just sit on your hands either. No, this is not a message of complacency. No. It's a message of saying, like you said, this is beautiful how it ties together. Like Joe's saying, God is have in Matthew twenty four have peace and whatever's to come. Be obedient. And those things will happen that look like failures. You know, uh, think about Peter and Paul. 
the church is just beginning and there's Nero with his circus, you know, of Christians just being tortured and mutilated on the streets. And that's what their dying view was. That's what they saw when they were dying. They saw a tortured church that was systematically being murdered and God overcame it. You mm -hmm. know, I'm sure Paul died with a rejoicing, worshiping heart that was like, it is time to meet my maker. I'm coming home, Lord. You know, well, I wish did. we had like more writings. It'd be like if we had letters and writings from them during that time. Oh, wouldn't that be treasure? It'd be you interesting. You mean Paul? He was. Well, I know prison. he was right. I know he was right. But like just during Nero, like just more. Because we know we too know. many people were getting murdered. <laughs> Probably a lot of it got burned too. And like, yeah. That sounded like just chaos time. Uh, it sounded really bad. Probably the worst. Yeah, I know. mean, that the church has ever seen as far as like a full frontal like attack, like God, mm -hmm. that's persecution. I don't know. Church has ever seen anything like that. You know, one other story I want to bring up real quick before we end is um, I was, um, well, Phil's reading uh, Job. And um, I was actually called Jack yesterday and I talked to him. He was reading Job, too. And I had read Job a few months ago. And um, you had said, that, you know, being silent. And having faith and sort of a hard nosed logic and fairness, the idea of suffering. And, um, you know, Job never cursed God. No. What was going on with him was very unfair. And um, he didn't he didn't speak out with his buddies sitting around him for, you know, 10 days grilling him on like, you must have done something wrong. You must have done something wrong. You know, good people don't get treated this way. That's not the way God works. You know, good things don't happen to bad to good. Bad things don't happen to good people. Right. And uh, he was he was silent. You know, he held his peace. You know, you could tell the writhing and the pain that he was in. But he knew he worshipped an all power. He knew who God was. You know, he knew who God was. And he didn't let that, you know, take God away his righteousness. Like, what did you say earlier on? Like about... Um, they're not logical enough. They're not <laughs> rational right? enough. It's yeah. almost like, do you serve an all-powerful God, and how are you saved? And like, do you put and this? And I love what you said too, within Mike. When like, it's not about being complacent. It's mm -hmm. not about being complacent. It's about no. being close with God. Well, people forget that like it's Jesus, about staying like, in your prayer. It's the hardest work you will, like. You know that song, Jesus, take the wheel. It's like the hardest thing you'll ever do is take your hands off the wheel. So let's just be honest with the fact. That's not written into the song, but that is definitely what the song is about. Like taking your hands off the wheel means that you're putting God in control. And, and that's that's destroying your pride. That's crucifying yourself with Christ. That's what you're called to do. And so that's, that's a very, very difficult. man. Um, that, that is the act of faith and crucifying your rationality sometimes. Um, I like the story of Job. I was actually um, thinking about that today. As well, it's funny you're bringing it up. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Thinking about Job, and um, I had a couple thoughts about Job that was was interesting to me. So, Job, like he's it's not only his silence, like we're we're silent, like the silence of knowing that God is God, but it's like you see. Like his friends, the accusation that goes on, and then God meeting him and like telling him who he is again. It's like that's what we get. That's that's like, and God's like, he's like, you don't know how awesome I am still, you know. And it's like, almost like something to look forward to. Like after you're done with the trial, it's like God's gonna be like, yeah, I'm about to show you a bit more exactly how awesome Majesty is. Like you want to know what glory looks like? Here's another. Here's a look at it for a second and it's like i guess you could read over that and it just sounds like god's kind of berating him or, or something but i'm sure Job was just sitting there in awe like oh my gosh god you are god you know and just it's almost like a gift god gives you for for enduring the trial amen yeah amen well guys thanks for tuning in um i think next time we might be hitting on some apologetics so Stay tuned for that. Oh, really? Exciting. It's going to be fun. Yeah. We have David on. Happy to learn. Yep. Yeah. Master Dave. Yep.